This week, my youngest turned four, and so we asked him what he wanted to do for his birthday. We said we'd take him anywhere, and he said, I want to go to Taco Bell. And being the good parents that we are on his birthday, we tried to convince him he wanted to go somewhere else than Taco Bell. We said, where do you want to go? And he was like, Taco Bell. I want to go to Taco Bell, Dad. We're like, how about a restaurant where there's a server? Taco Bell. Like, we tried everything. And it started earlier in the week when we were getting him ready for this, where he was just steadfast on McDonald's. And I, I made the mistake of just telling Brooke, I wish he would pick anywhere other than McDonald's. <laughs> and he did. He did. So Wednesday night on his birthday, we walked into Taco Bell for his birthday dinner because that's where he wanted to go on his birthday. And we ordered and we sat down and my kids have a lot of energy. They're like their mother. And so my oldest, it's true, it's true. My oldest is like, he can't, he's got, got ants in his pants. He wouldn't just sit down. I'm like, dude, just, just sit down. And he's like, turning around. He wants to get refills. His cup isn't empty, but he wants to get refills anyways. He wants to get sauces. He hates the sauces at Taco Bell, but he wants to get the sauce packets. He needs more silverware. Everything that Taco Bell serves is eaten with your fingers, but he still, he wants, he wants to get silverware, not because he's actually going to use the silverware. He just wants to get out of his seat, and he's just constantly up and moving, and he almost hit the table next to us, and I look over, and on that table is, is a car seat carrier and a little baby quiet and asleep in that car seat carrier. And I'm like, sit down right now. Do not wake up that baby. Leave the child alone. But it just caused me to think back of how quick it, it all goes by and how much life changes and how in every single stage of their lives, things change and they move so Quickly, And some days feel like they last forever, but in a blink of an eye, years go by. And I just started thinking a lot about, about life and a lot about, a lot about their childhood and as they grow up into adolescence and then adulthood, what I want for them. And, and just started thinking about my own life a little bit as well and went through all these thought processes and, and was just thinking about life in, in a greater Greater, greater span in greater terms. And when we think about our lives, in, in all of our lives, this is universal. It's not, it's not unique to myself or to you. This is universal. The most important aspects of our lives are oftentimes the most difficult to decipher. The most important aspects of our lives are oftentimes the most difficult to decipher. Every single one of us faces this. Each of us at some, at some time, in some way, each of us asks two questions that are universal and that are fundamental to who we are as individuals. And those two questions that everybody asks at some level, and people come to different conclusions and different answers on, but the two questions, the two things that every single person has to figure out in their life are who is God? And what is love? Every single person has to come to a conclusion on these two subjects. And the way that people get to that conclusion looks different. And the conclusions that people draw look different. However, every single individual asks those two questions. Who is God? And what is love? And as followers of Jesus, we understand that these two areas are not separate. In fact, they are intimately linked together. They are connected. The answer to who is God and the answer to what is love is intimately connected together. God and love can't be separated. And in order to understand one, we have to understand the other. And so that's what we're going to do over these next few weeks and something we're calling It's All About Love. And as you made your way in, you should have been given a button here just to remind you it's all about love and the hashtag on the bottom, Lakeside Algoma, because here at Lakeside Community Church, we are all about love. And so I just want to take a minute and just pause, just, just real quick. I just want to pause as, as these buttons came in. They were supposed to arrive earlier this week, and then we had a, a delay 
uh, the proof got delayed, and so there was an issue on their end, not on our end. But the shipment didn't end up coming in until Friday, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm going to worried about being here to receive the shipment and everything. And that, didn't, that wasn't an issue because some of you know our incredible business administrator and office manager, Sean, she was here that day. And I just want to publicly shout out Sean because in the last year, she has done so much to keep this church running in ways that people have no idea. So Sean, thank you for all that you do. And I say that, I say that because she's going to be on a staycation, and so if things start falling through the cracks, it's on me, all right? Don't send Sean the angry emails, it's my fault, but Sean, thank you for everything you've done in the interim to keep this place operating, and thank you for all that you do to make Lakeside what it is. Thank you very much. So, it's all about love. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now, John was one of Jesus' three closest friends. You know, you, you probably have a lot of friends. You probably have a lot of acquaintances. So did Jesus. But there were three who were his best friends. And John was one of those three best friends that Jesus had. John went on to write five books in the New Testament. John wrote five books of the Bible. One was, was the biography of Jesus and what Bible scholars call a gospel. All right, so he wrote the, the book of John. Then he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Are you noticing a theme here? However, the fifth book he wrote was Revelation. Didn't throw his name in that one. But the other four, he's like, yeah, that's me. I'm writing that. So that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to dive into this morning at 1st John, starting verse 1, where we find this. You can follow along on your tablets or your phones on the Bible apps. If those aren't out, then you can follow along on the screens. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which was from the beginning. See, Jesus is eternal. Jesus is fully God. So Jesus is eternal, and yet we have a really hard time wrapping our, our minds around that concept, right? When you think about eternity, it's really difficult to think of something that's eternal because we're not eternal beings. And so it's a really, really difficult concept for us to understand this idea of eternity because we're, we're not. And so from, from our scope, from our understanding, from our part of the story, from humanity's part of the story... God was there from the beginning, in the beginning, right, as Genesis starts, and Jesus was there. He was part of that. So Jesus is eternal, but from our scope, from our part of the story, he, Jesus was there from the start. We've heard the message. The entire Old Testament was, was all pointing to the arrival of Jesus. The Bible hinges on Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament was pointing to the arrival of Jesus. Everything in the New Testament is revealing that Jesus has arrived and pointing back to the hope that we have as a result of what Jesus has done for us. So we heard the message of hope. We saw the arrival of hope. John was there. He got to see it with his own eyes. He was one of the best friends of God, and he touched God in the flesh. All that to say, this has radically changed John's life. This has changed his life. This has changed who he is at his core. He has seen God at work. And his life has been changed. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you. So that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father. And with his Son Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The whole point of John's writing. The whole point of John's writing is this. For us to be changed. He was changed as a result of his encounter with God. And the whole point of his writing these things down is for us to be changed. That was the entire point of his books. That was the entire point of his life. So I just want to ask this question. Is at any point in our lives the point of our lives to introduce others to hope? Is at any point in our lives the point of our lives to introduce others to to hope. And if so, what are we doing about it? And this doesn't mean that everybody needs to go out and preach a sermon. 
or memorize all kinds of Bible verses and be able to quote the Bible chapter and verse. But if we're living our lives in a way that we are pointing no one to the hope that we profess that we have, then our lives are out of balance. And if we're living our lives in a way that we have nobody in our lives, that we are actively pointing to Jesus and helping them become more like Jesus, then somewhere along the way we've missed it and our priorities are out of order. And we need to adjust the way that we're living our lives. And we need to look at the relationships that we have and question how we're interacting in those relationships. He says this, that you too may have the fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. See, understand, John was saying, we are united together. We are united together by our faith in Jesus. There are all kinds of things that divide us, but we are united together by our faith in Jesus. And once again, Lakeside, that is our rallying cry, that all the differences that we have, they're actually a benefit because they help us be diverse. But we put all those things aside and we are unified, if in nothing else, than in our common faith in Jesus. We are united together. Why? Because we are united with God. And that is greater than ourselves. And since we are united with God, we are now united together. And our joy then, once we are united with God and united together, then our joy can be complete. So let me ask you a question. Is your joy complete? It's for a lot of people who say they love Jesus. When you look at their lives, there's just an element that's missing. And it's joy. And there can be factors in your life that are temporary And we're not saying that you have to fake it. We're not saying that you have to put a false sense of joy in your face. But if your life is one that is continually miserable, and you're a drainer to be around constantly, and there's always a problem, and people don't even want to ask you anymore, how are you, which is just a throwaway line that they probably don't even mean anyways, but you're the one person who actually takes it literally, and you're like, I'm miserable, and they keep asking you, how are you, and every time they get the same answer to the point, they're just like, hey, bud, that's it, because they don't want the answer anymore. But if your life is continually defined this way where you are just a miserable person and you're miserable to be around, things are out of balance. Maybe you need to ask the question, what brings me joy? Because maybe somewhere along the lines it stopped being the very thing that should give you joy and fulfillment. A relationship with God and instead became what you have. It became your health. It became your occupation. And when you put all of your time and all of your effort and all of your energy in those things, you rob yourself. Because your health will fail you. Your job will continue without you. So let's make sure that our joy is found in the place that it should be found. And that's in our relationship with Jesus. This is the message we have heard from him. And proclaim to you. That God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And so John's just, he's drawing a picture here for us. He's drawing a picture and he's establishing a contrast. And he says, God is light. He's using a universal element that everybody can understand. And he learned this idea from the way that Jesus communicated with people. And he says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. He builds this contrast that God is just a blaring light, the absence of darkness. 
And evil is darkness without any light at all. But here is the contrast that he builds. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And then he builds on it. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness. I used to be a student pastor. One of the things that we would do every year is a summer extravaganza. And we would take the students to, for week-long trips and try not to get in too much trouble. I mean, there's a very fine line. You want to get in trouble as a student pastor, but not like, not the police are called trouble. That's generally like a good, good idea of where the line is. Once people are threatening to call the police, maybe we'll just take a couple steps back. All right. So we went uh, one time. We went zip lining into, to a cave in right outside of St. Louis, Missouri, the Merrimack Caverns, and and maybe some of you have been there. And, and at one point in time, they, they do a blackout. And again, you're in a cave. So when they kill the lights, it's really, really, really dark. And when you have a group of 50-some students and they're killing the lights, it's just right for incidents to happen, which you're just aware of. And you're just like, please, no one just die. I mean, if you do, we're, we've signed waivers, so we realize we're still going to get sued. But we have a little bit of protection here because of the signed waiver. But you're just like, I'll handle injury, but nobody please die. Well, one of the guys thought it was going to be really funny to scare a girl. Why? Because he was 15 and he liked her. And when you're 15, you don't know how to flirt. And so that's what he was, was going to do. He's like, I'm going to scare her in the dark. This is going to be great. And it's like, all right, whatever. I'm sure one day you'll be married and have a bunch of kids and it'll be a great story. Probably not. You'll probably break up six weeks later and then lead to all kinds of drama. And then half the students won't want to talk to him and half the students won't want to talk to her. You know, just the typical relationships within the church, the way that it goes. And all the students are like, all right, which one am I going to be friends with when they break up six weeks later? All that to say, he decided he was going to try to make his move. And he was going to flirt with her by scaring her in a dark cave. He was not right next to her, so he was going to have to walk. Well, what happens in darkness is you get a little disoriented. Dude face planted as he was trying to go scare the girl. We just hear a thud, and they turn the lights back on, and we look over, and he's, he's got some, just some spots of blood falling from his knees, and his face is scraped up. It's not bleeding, and we're just all like, what just happened to you? And of course, he's not in front of everybody going to be like, so I had this idea that I was going to flirt with her, and I was going to scare up, walk up to her and scare her in the dark, and he's just like, I just tripped and fell? We're like, What? See, every time you try to walk in darkness, it generally doesn't, doesn't end well. Maybe if you're a parent of young kids, you've had the luxury of stepping on a Lego in the middle of the night, which means everybody in the house is going to be awake because that is a whole new level of pain that is on, I mean, it is just the top of the threshold right there. Or maybe you've stubbed your toe or something else. I found any time it's like the middle of the night, and I'm trying to sneak in. I don't even try to sneak in anymore. Because if I try to sneak in, I'm going to make more noise and wake up, Brooke. But if I'm just like, yeah, whatever, I'm just going to stroll into bed and like throw myself on the bed, she'll stay asleep. It's amazing. But as soon as I start trying to sneak in, that's where the trouble lies. Why? Because anytime you're trying to walk around in darkness, things aren't going to work. It's not going to work. Every single time, if you walk around long enough, you're going to discover trouble. Here's the deal. Our conduct reveals our character. Our conduct reveals our character. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Listen to me. I want you to understand if you honor God with what you say and yet live your life in a way where you are actively, actively fleeing the, the standards that God has put in place for your life, it will not end well for you. And I know it might feel good right now and you might be like, well, this is, but I promise you this, listen to me, please, it will not end well for you. 
If we say that we love him and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Here's the deal. Sin, sin breaks our relationship with God. Sin destroys our relationship with God. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. While we were far from God, while we rebelled against God, God loved us anyway in spite of that rebellion and made a way that we could have a relationship with him. Jesus paid the price for my mistakes, for my rebellion, for my shortcomings, for my failings, for my regrets. Jesus paid the price for me. And he paid the price for you. And the question that we have to ask is this. Are we going to let the light pierce the darkness? Are we going to let the light Pierce the darkness because every time you let light in, it drives away the darkness. Are you going to let the light pierce the darkness in your life? Are you going to live your life in a way that brings God honor? Are you going to follow him? I am not... I know this is going to be a big surprise, so please brace yourself. I don't want anyone to fall. All right. I am not the most outdoorsy type person. I know, it was shocking. Like some people, their idea of fun is to go ice fishing. That sounds to me like being grounded for a month as a teenager. <laughs> what in the world? Do you not have a supermarket? Like, and, and honestly, I'll buy you a fish if you're hungry. Don't put yourself through that. I like, just don't, I, and I get it. Some, you know, sorry guys. You're like, oh babe, we're, we're going to go fishing. Translation, it's just hours of silence. That's the only reason you're out there. And you're like, all right, the honey list and to be nagged or six hours freezing to death on the lake, but silence. I'm going silence, right? So I understand that there's that element for it. And guys, let me, let me let you in on a little secret. She's just as happy, if not more happy, that you're gone than you are to be gone, right? So you're like, ha ha, I fooled her. She is rejoicing, all right? She's singing into her hairbrush in the mirror, all right? Like she's 14 all over again. She's so happy you're out of the house, so happy. Now, I'm not the most outdoorsy type person. And so I used to have a fire pit in my backyard in Ohio, and I didn't really want to go to the hardware store and buy those instant logs, because that's just cheating. That's really just cheating. So instead, I used lighter fluid or gasoline. So one day, <clears throat> one day I was out. I was out of all of that. And I went through like a whole pack of matches. And I don't mean like those 20 matches that stores used to or restaurants used to pass out when you could smoke in restaurants or lounges. I mean, like, the hundred matches that you get from, from the store. Just compl- could not get this fire lit. And finally, I had a good friend, and he just started laughing. He said, you got a magnifying glass? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I don't need any matches. I'm like, what? He's like, you got a magnifying glass in the house? I'm like, yeah. He's like, go get it. So I went and I got a magnifying glass, and it, it wasn't this one. This is way nicer than the magnifying glass I had. Uh, but I went and I got a magnifying glass and I handed it to him. He said, come learn. And I'm just like, what a jerk. Who looks at you and is like, come learn? <laughs> but I wanted to. And so he went, and, and there, was a, there was a pine tree that my neighbor had, but it had some, some pine needles that, that went over into to my yard. And he grabbed some of that and he grabbed a couple other dead leaves. And he went over to the fire pit, and he pushed, like, pretty much over everything that I had done. And he started this little area, and he built this thing that that looked like a teepee a little bit. And then he took the magnifying glass, and he put it right over. And I'm like, dude, this is this is going to take forever. This is not going to work. He's like, shh, just watch. I'm like, all right, I got nothing better to do. Sounds good. Within 10 minutes, we had smoke. A couple minutes after that, we had flames. Because he'd taken the magnifying glass and he saw where the sun was. And he took it and he placed it. He 
from the heat of the sun radiating off the glass and the light. And I'm sure there's some other scientific thing going on that I don't understand. But he got the fire started. What John is doing is he's giving us an invitation to take a magnifying glass. And instead of looking out, looking in. And seeing where the light needs to go in our lives. Driving out the darkness. Letting the light go to work. And if we will... It's going to be hard work, and we're going to see some things we don't want to see, and we're going to have to address some areas that we don't want to have to address, and there's going to be some pain involved. If we'll go to work, let that light go to work within us, there will be incredible results. So this is an invitation for all of us to look within. He says this, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Understand this, the most dangerous deception is self-deception. The most dangerous deception is self-deception. When we aren't faithful, God still is. When we aren't faithful, God still is. But we have to come to the place where we recognize the parts within us that we don't like to deal with, that we don't want to recognize, because all of us like to think that we've got it going on. All of us like to think that we have it together. And literally the message of Jesus is you're not okay. And I understand that that's offensive. Especially in a society that tells you you're the champion at everything you do. It doesn't matter if your team doesn't win a single game in the Little League, you're still going to get a trophy. I understand that this message is one that, that is offensive at its core. Because the message of the gospel is you aren't enough and you aren't okay. But it's the truth. And if we hold on to that, that we are enough, and if we hold on to the fact that we don't have to change anything about us, we deceive ourselves and the truth, and God is not in us. But if we confess our sins, if we come to terms with the fact that all of us have made mistakes, all of us have done things that we regret, all of us have hurt others, if we come to terms with that fact and we confess that, if we just say, God, I've messed up, I can't do this on my own, I need you, I need your son, Jesus, if we confess that, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to take those failings and to wash them away, to make us clean. When we aren't faithful, God still is. If we say we have not sinned, we make him, we make God a liar, and his word is not in us. And so as we look at love, we first have to come to terms with who God is. And in that process, we come to terms with who we are. God loves you. He loves us so much that in spite of our rebellion, He still desires a relationship with us. And I'm sure I'm talking to some people today who God has forgiven, but you haven't forgiven yourself. And I just want to ask you a question. If God's willing to forgive you, why do you have such a hard time forgiving yourself? Some of us, it may be time that we just need to let go of some things that we've been carrying around for way too long. 
Because if we confess it, he'll forgive it. There aren't any conditions to that. So some of you just need to let go of that regret and that hurt that you've been carrying around for a really long time. If God's forgiven us, why can't we forgive ourselves? So I want to ask you a question. Do you need to forgive yourself? For someone else? For something you've been hanging on to? See, when we start to look within, it can be really painful. But it can also be really freeing. Because we understand that God is faithful when we aren't. And forgiveness is available. Just first, forgive yourself. And second, if you've, made, if you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, I just want to ask you, what's holding you back? And third, let's make sure that we're people whose lives mirror what we say let's make sure that our conduct reveals our character and we point people to Jesus God help us understand you help us understand your incredible love for us that in spite of the fact that we aren't faithful, in spite of the fact that we've rebelled, you still love us. And so God, I pray for the person here who's never made the decision to enter into a relationship with you. And I pray, God, that you would just strip away in their heart right now every excuse that they have. And they would just understand your love for them. God, I pray that you would help those who made the decision to follow you. I pray that you'd help their conduct be honoring to you. God, I pray in the quietness of this moment right now, each of us would do the hard work of looking within and seeing what we need to change. And you'd help us go to work. I pray for the person who's carrying around baggage for years, or months, or maybe even days. That they would embrace forgiveness. That you'd allow them to see themselves in the way that you do. And you'd allow them to forgive themselves. God, as we learn about love, help us learn about you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for loving us when we had nothing to offer you. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.